Overlooking Flagstaff in the campus of Northern Arizona, the historic Lowell Observatory continues to be a source of groundbreaking astronomical research and discovery. As a National Historic Landmark since 1965, and in 2011 named by Time Magazine one of the world's 100 most important places, you would think its popularity and recognition would be out of this world. Not true, as this national monument seems about as distant to Flagstaff as the stars in the night sky. My mission was to get a closer look at the history and features Lowell Observatory has to offer. Media and Communications Coordinator Tom Patron helped guide me through the Lowell campus stopping to check out two of the world's most famous telescopes. So the historic Clark Telescope here at Lowell Observatory is among the most famous in American history. It's a 32 foot long tube that leads to a 24 inch lens. Most modern telescopes are mirror based, but this is a lens based telescope as most main big ones we had in the 19th century were. It does have a secondary lens uh, to make the light condense a little faster, but as you can tell the technologies, the understanding of light to condense that light quickly did not really exist yet. They now know how to actually bend the light in ways so that the tube doesn't have to be 32 feet long. But in, in 1896, when it was built, this was still the state of the art. Uh, things you'll notice, a bunch of finer telescopes that let you find things in a, with a wider field of view. Because the main telescope, it's a very small field of view. Very focused, but very small. Uh, you have knobs here that tell you by touch what you're holding, in case you're operating the telescope at night and all you have is red light, you can know by touch what you're holding. Um, you've got the right ascension clock that tells you left to right in the sky, left to right being the way that uh, the sky seems to process at night because of the Earth's rotation. And uh, the declination wheel, which would be up and down, is what you have there at the equatorial mount of this telescope. And to actually see that, it's pretty funny, to see that wheel correctly, you have to look at it off a reflection in that mirror box and then look at it at that mirror with a telescope. So you have to see through a telescope to see halfway up this telescope. Uh, it's an amazing thing. It's famous for really three major works. Uh, the work of Percival Lowell. He bought this telescope specifically to look at Mars, but really in its design it was really a fabulous solar system telescope. He obviously didn't find evidence of life, but he researched Mars more heavily than anyone before. A uh, guy that he hired came in after and did research of nebula and galaxies, and he figured out using this telescope with a spectrograph attached that the universe was expanding. He was the first guy to get evidence of that. His name is V.M. Slipher. And the third really famous thing that was done with this was in the 1960s. Again, a great solar system telescope. NASA used this as one of two primary telescopes to map the moon. We were in the area, and then when I saw the observatory was open, I decided that it would be a great trip because I taught astronomy as a sixth grade teacher. And so I, yeah. I taught the redshift to my students. Awesome. So it was interesting to see where it was where it was discovered, actually. Looking at his sketches were incredible, too. So we're in the Pluto Telescope Dome now. You're looking at the 13-inch Pluto Telescope. Uh, it's a very purpose-driven telescope. The search for what had been known as Planet X actually had been done in 1905 and 1915 here at Lowell, but not with a telescope designed with that search in mind. They'd been doing it with the big Clark Telescope. Didn't work quite as well. We found out much later that Percival Lowell actually saw Pluto in 1905 with the big telescope, but he didn't find it because he didn't know what he was looking at. In 1930, a gentleman named Clyde Tompa, who had hired from Kansas, a really good advanced amateur astronomer of a young age, so had a lot of energy and a lot of knowledge for someone of his age who really hadn't had any formal training at all. Uh, we sent him in here with the dome completed, the telescope here, uh, to search for Planet X. And we had coordinates as to where to look. And uh, so he looked in Gemini and took two pictures about a week apart. This is the way you do it with this search and then go in our museum and use the blink comparator and using the blink comparator you could 
kind of get a, an idea, your eye picks up what has changed between those two pictures. Ideal, ideally, they're the exact same field that you have taken pictures of, and he did. And in, in January 30th, 1930, is actually when he took that second image, he didn't look at them until about six weeks later, just because of the backlog, and we announced it March 13th, 1930, we found Pluto. We don't observe through it anymore just because of the kind of telescope it is, uh, but it could be used if you wanted to, and it's uh, obviously shown to the public through public tours daily. Your odds of hitting your head on this were really good. So Henry Gickless, the guy who came in here after Clyde Tombaugh and used the telescope extensively, hit his head on this thing one too many times. So he had been a boxer. He went and found a boxing glove from his boxing days, put it on there. This is, I believe, the second glove that's been on there, not the first one, but uh, this one has been on there for something like 30 plus years, so it's, uh, it's just one of those quirky little things, but there's no better fix than a boxing glove for it. So.